The Collector Part 2 Finding himself, rather unexpectedly, to be a new convert to artistic culture, Reginald Gawthorn looks forward to pursuing his recent interests, despite having endured the criticism of his activities by his father at their recent lunch. When the meal was over, he hastened back to his friend's studio and they both set out on an exhibition down some of the back streets where good things are to be picked up occasionally. This day, however, the good things were scarce. In the first dealer's shop that they entered, however, Mr. Gawthorn found a curious old tray on which was painted a farmyard scene George Morland was the painter, the dealer averred. And Mr. Vincent said it might be by Morland, well, or anyone else. Reginald bought it for a couple of pounds. A painting on iron by George Morland is certainly worth a couple of pounds. I knew this one wasn't by George Morland, Vincent said, but that was where he was wrong. The tray was brought to the expert who knows all about George Morland to the exclusion of every other painter and every other subject. But George Morland's pictures, and he declared that the tray had been decorated by this painter, he was able to say definitely where he was residing when he'd done the work. And he offered Reginald Gawthorne 40 guineas for it which Reginald declined. He was congratulated by his friend Vincent on his judgment in this transaction, and he exhibited his phone that very evening to Alicia. She was delighted with it and contrasted this absolutely unique article with the horrid electroplated thing on which Mrs. Banks' Sham Queen Anne tea service had reposed. She called Reggie a clever old darling and expressed the hope that since he had made so successful a beginning, he would continue to collect things which would make his house unlike any other in the world. But when in the course of the next week he exhibited five other painted trays, most of them woefully dilapidated, which he had picked up in various quarters. She was not quite so enthusiastic. She only said, however, that she thought they could manage to set up house with a light heart, even if they never had another painted tray. She hoped that Reggie would turn his attention in another direction. Her hope was realised. He turned his attention to old picture frames. He found a beautiful Italian specimen in a small shop, and Alicia went into raptures over it. When it was regilded and hung in a room, everyone who knew anything about 17th century Italian art would envy her the possession of such a treasure. He spent Ten days doing nothing else but searching for old frames. He paid a trifle over a hundred pounds for the nine he managed to obtain. Lucia was more than satisfied. What on earth are we going to do with ten empty frames? she cried. He smiled the smile of the collector when he hears people apply the ordinary canons of utility to the result of his labours. He made up his mind that he would not be deterred by the exclamations of any woman from buying every really fine picture frame that might be offered to him. Quite simply, he had become a collector. The disease had taken a firm hold on him. He began his perambulation of the dealer shops immediately after breakfast, and he never returned home for lunch. 
He read no books except those which had some bearing upon old furniture and old tapestry and ceramics. And no day passed without his acquiring something that was either beautiful or curious or both. He purchased a chair here and there and now and again a sofa or two. During one happy week, he seemed to do nothing else but stumble over sets of mahogany tall boys. He succeeded in acquiring six sets, all perfect save one, and that was only deficient in a single escutcheon. The general began to grumble. He wondered why Reggie was filling the house with rubbish and threatened to send the tall boys and the old sofas and the mantelpieces to Birch's repository. He would not allow them to litter his house any longer, he said. When, towards the end of the month, two vans rumbled up to the door, the one containing old oak panelling that had just been torn from a church in Cornwall, and the other about a thousand square feet of old parquet, Sir Arthur carried out his threat. He sent the vans to Birch's repository. He wrote and wrote to Messrs Birch, directing them to send for the tall boys, the sofas, the chairs and the old frames. I don't mind paying for the warehousing or whatever you may be fool enough to buy, said he to his son. But I decline to allow my house to serve as premises for the incubation of moths. All right, said Reggie. I'll get the other things sent to Birch's. The next morning he got a letter from his banker telling him that he had considerably overdrawn his account. This was a blow to him, for he was at that moment in a treaty for a number of very fine fireplaces in a Dublin mansion that was about to be destroyed to make room for workmen's dwellings. He had been across the channel and had come to the conclusion that he should be a fool if he were to let these pieces fall into any other hands than his. The mantelpieces were five in number and every one of them was a specimen of which any museum might be proud. He went to his father and asked him for the loan of £120. He got a cheque for the amount and sent it to the Dublin dealer, who had the disposal of the mantelpieces. The same afternoon he started for Amsterdam, where he heard there was a genuine Verne Martin cabinet for sale. On his return, he asked his father for a cheque for £250, and his father refused to grant him this trifling loan. I am not at all satisfied with the way you have been spending money of late, said Sir Arthur. I can't for the life of me see what you want with five sofas. There's no else with five gilt sofas in it. Our house is not to be as other houses, said his son. So I gather it will be like no house under the sky, said his father. Sofas and old picture frames and trays daubed with paint and chests of drawers. Oh, those chests of drawers. Why, you haven't clothes enough to fill one of them, and I question very much if Alicia has frocks enough to stuff into another. Oh, one doesn't buy specimens like these for utility, said Reginald. Perhaps not. Anyhow, you'll not get any more money from me for such rubbish. Look here, my boy. If you take my advice, you'll settle down to your work again and try to earn enough money to marry on. You've done nothing but idle for the past four months. Idle? Idle, said Reggie bitterly, and then he laughed, the laugh of the collector.
who hears himself sneered at in an auction room. He went out and drove to his publishers, contracting for another book and drawing £250 in advance of royalties. The Vernet Martin cabinet was his. He brought his fiancée to see it when it arrived at Birch's. He was amazed at her want of enthusiasm about it. He knew that it was a magnificent specimen, and the man in Birch's ventured to congratulate him on having secured it. Alicia only was silent. It is splendid, she said as they drove away. But where would it be in any house that we could afford to live in? You are so desperately practical, said he. My dear Alicia, what does it matter where we put it? Whether we put it anywhere or not, the thing is ours, our very own. How would you like to think of that cabinet belonging to someone else? And less than six months ago, you would have been content with such furniture as the bank says, she said. Just think of it, said he. Why, there's nothing in the house good enough for firewood. For one of your Cromwellian greats, said she. But Reggie, love, think of the end of the year. Was it not March that was the month we agreed upon? Dear me, I had quite forgotten that we were to be married in March, said he. Oh yes, it was to be in March, she said. But of course if... Dearest, it is quite impossible. I spent every penny of my own money and I borrowed from my father. We must put off our wedding. Very well, dear. I'm sure Mamma will be delighted. She does not like the idea of my leaving her. I will leave you with her for six months after March. Yes, I think I can manage to pull myself together in that time. And so, after some deliberation, he made up his mind to settle down to his new work. After all, a man cannot collect unless he has some ready money. He did his best to settle down to his work, and both his father and Alicia were delighted. They were a great deal together in those days, and had many conferences unknown to Reggie. Unfortunately, however, he received a cheque for a thousand pounds from the executors of a college friend of his who had died, bequeathing him that sum as a memento of their friendship. And the day he lodged it in his bank, he made another tour of the dealers and bought about a hundred pounds worth of lowest software. At the same time, he learned of the possible sale at a villa near Marseille of the famous table painted by Boucher for the Marquis de Boisvivier. It would very likely go cheap enough, his information said. He was looking up the Continental Guide when his father entered the room with Alicia. Alicia agrees with me in thinking that you've been so lucky. That is, as you, well, you've received that sad token of the regard of your poor friend. It would be foolish for you to waste any more time, said Sir Arthur. Yes, I have persuaded her to agree to make you a happy man at the date originally fixed on. March, was it not? Ah, I don't think that we have started quite a new idea in his mind, <laughs> laughed Alicia. He is looking up the Continental Guide. Pray do not suggest the Riviera, Reggie. 
I have set my heart on Rome in March. Uh, yes, yes, he said vacantly. Of course, we can get married in March, and there's no reason why we shouldn't go to Rome. However, I've heard of an ebony and ivory chair. Oh, never mind the ebony and ivory chair, said Sir Arthur. Take Alicia home and consider yourself the luckiest fellow in the world. She may have a surprise for you before you reach Kensington. I should be delighted, only that, that, uh, well, I fear that I shall have to run across to Paris, said Reggie. What are we going to Paris for? cried the general. Well, it, it's not. Exactly, Paris, you see, uh, but uh, I'll be ab absent, I'll be absent for three or four days. Look here, sir, said the general, in one of those whispers of his that used to be audible over the ground occupied by five regiments. What is it now? Is it some damn chair or a cabinet? Neither, neither. It's one chance in a lifetime, said Reggie. Your chance of a lifetime is here, sir. Here, shouted his father. You have been frittering away your chances during the past seven months, but I've said nothing. Now, however, the time has come for me to speak. Look you, Reginald. Gorton, if you go across to Paris or any place else to throw away that money which has come to you as a, a, a well sacred trust, if you throw away any of it upon your rubbish of bric a brac or ormolu, or whatever you choose to call it, you needn't think that you'll return to my house. Oh, Sir Arthur, don't be so ridiculous said Alicia. I've seen the way you've treated this charming girl, continued the general, paying no attention at all to her interruption. And I felt my blood boiling, sir, boiling, sir. But the time has come, and I can keep silent no longer. I repeat, sir, that you don't enter... Now, now, Sir Arthur, pray do not say anything more, said Alicia. Reginald, I'm sure you will not go to Paris unless you have really important business to transact. But if you feel that you must go, it won't make any difference to me. You're a sensible girl, said Reginald. It was painted by Boucher. The table, I mean. It was in the possession of the Marquis de bois -Vipère. And then, at this point, the general exploded. If that table comes within reach of my foot, I'll not leave a whole timber in it, he cried, picking up his hat. Timber, shouted Reggie. Why, it's, it's serve. Save and Ormolu. With an expression of exasperation, the general charged the door of the room and cut his way through the hall beyond. Go if you wish, Reggie, said Alicia. Only, well, I don't think you should. Your father has been so very kind. If it were anything else but that table. Oh, Alicia, if I missed it, I should never forgive myself. Goodbye, said she, quietly, after a pause. He allowed her to go, and he started for Marseille that very evening. But when he found himself aboard the boat, 
he began to think that perhaps he had not behaved so well as he might have done. What were all the tables in the world to him compared with the affection of his father? He had treated his father very badly, and Alicia, well, she had given him leave to go. But still, he did not like the look that she had given him. That look had been in her eyes as she said that word, only. He began to wonder how he had ever been so great a fool as to fancy that he wanted that table. He did not want it. He knew now that all he wanted was to prevent someone else from getting it. He did not get further than Calais. He returned by the night boat and reaching Charing Cross in the morning, he bought a newspaper. On the first page was a long account of the total destruction by fire of the repository of Messrs. Birch. The paper fell from his fingers. He covered his face with his hands. He drove at once to Alicia. She was just sitting down to breakfast with her mother. He burst into the room and caught her in his arms. My dearest, my dearest, they're all gone. All the things are gone. But you are not gone, darling. Thank heaven I still have you, he cried, kissing her wildly. What on earth is the matter? I thought you'd gone to Paris, she said, and when she had a breathing space. Is it possible you haven't heard of it? Birch's repository burnt down, he cried. Everything is gone, everything. But I still have you, Alicia. Thank heaven for that. I have not seen a paper yet, said she. What is it all burned? Every stick, floor after floor fell in. But you're here. You're here, my beloved. Yes, yes, I am here, she said. Wait till I get on my hat. I'll go with you and make peace with your father. I'm so glad you take it so well, said he, when they were together in a hansom. How did that madness ever seize me? But they were lovely things, all of them. You know, they were lovely things. And gone, all gone. Where's a man driving us, anyway? He asked. I have to make a call, said she. The hansom pulled up outside a lovely old house in the Victoria Road. I'll wait for you in the hansom, said he. Nothing of the sort. You must come in with me she said. The door of the house was opened by one of those curious nondescripts known as caretakers. She was in curl papers, but he did not notice this. He was staring at the oak cabinet in the hall, at the carved brackets, at the trophy of Moorish weapons. He had bought them all. Without a word, Alicia threw open the door of the dining room. The room was covered with panels of old oak and the furniture was all of his collecting. With a cry of delight, he moved aside the portier at the archway. There, at the end of the drawing room, stood his Vene Martin cabinet. And round the room were his Louis XV chairs and two of his sofas. My darling, he said, taking Alicia's hand. 
I see it all now. My father said something about the surprise. Ah, oh, a surprise indeed. He got all the things from Birch's. They were stored here in his name. Ah, oh, my dearest, you have saved them. And, oh, why would we need to wait for March? We can be married tomorrow. She paused, but then explained to him that that was quite out of the question. But it will be as soon as you please after tomorrow, she said. Oh, my dear Reggie, it was I who was the fool. I led you into the thorny paths of the collector. But who could ever have fancied that you, who treated all manners of art with such disdain, would become such an enthusiast? Why, it was you who actually thought that you could actually live comfortably in the Banks's house. Oh, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it at all, said he with some remorse. And like the faithful fiancé and wife she was about to become, she did not talk about it. She never did.